Hi guys, Dr. Gillard here again. Today we're going to talk about abdominal wall hernias, inguinal hernias, femoral hernias. Pretty complex topic. But before we do that, I think we need to refresh your gross 2 and gross 1 anatomy on this stuff so it'll make sense. If you are an expert in anatomy of the abdominal wall, the inguinal canal, the umbilicus, then you don't need to watch this video probably be a few questions on the final from it um, so you could just go to the next video but if you're not you better watch this video all right here we go so start with the anterior abdominal wall stick a pin through the anterior abdominal wall through the side not through the rectus abdominis uh, here's what you get you have a skin layer dermis and epidermis superficial fascia remember that's the one with all the different aka's also called the subcutaneous layer the subcutis there's a whole bunch of aka's anatomy we usually call it the superficial fascia but it's the same it's the third layer down remember underneath the belly button it changes it it grows a new layer a really thick membranous layer or not thick but it's thin you can put sutures through it um, so that's called scarpa's layer there's also a camper's layer, which is on top. That's the fatty layer, scarpas. Remember, above the belly button, you really just call it superficial fascia. Some people still call it campers because it still has fat in it. Okay, our pin is going through the kind of the sides where the flat muscles are, aka pubic muscles. Who are the flat muscles? Those are the external oblique and its aponeurosa, internal oblique and its aponeurosa transversus abdominis and its aponeurosa. Now, the if you stuck a pin through the rectus abdominis, those are called the vertical muscles. Remember there's also a little tiny one down below called the pyramidalis. It's usually lost in dissection. Uh, but you'd have the same layers only you'd get down to the rectus abdominis and there is no fascia uh, that's pure muscle and there's a right and left fascicle of the rectus abdominis All right so back to any layer now when you get beneath the final muscle layer you're into the deep fascia and the deep fascia has three layers it has a transversalis fascia a very important it gives support to the abdominal cavity it's the last layer if you put a hole in your transversalis fascia you're prone to herniation of intestinal material uh, then there's the extra peritoneal or I say peritoneal it should be peritoneum can't get that went to the medical school I went to was British base and they say peritoneum but extra peritoneal fascial layer aka preperitoneal fat uh, aka preperitoneal tissue preperitoneal adipose there's a whole bunch of AKs for it it's just a layer in between the transversalis fascia and the parietal peritoneal layer or parietal peritoneum aka uh, it has some regions like back by the kidneys there's a lot of fat in it up in the front there's not much fat so these are the three amigos that make up the deep fascia once you get through the parietal peritoneal layer uh, then you are in the greater sac or in the uh, peritoneal cavity and remember the visceral peritoneum uh, then in, encompasses all the organs like the intestines are wrapped with another uh, layer of peritoneum and between them is the peritoneal cavity that's where you get ascites you can leak uh, fluid remember it's a serous membrane it secretes fluid and you guys know that okay here's a nice uh, drawing so this is an A to P view we're looking straight at the patient there's the belly button or the umbilicus uh, and uh, the, we'll talk about the rectus sheath. Remember, the rectus sheath is very important. The, the rectus abdominis, both uh, fascicles are encompassed in a rectus sheath, which is made up of the, the uh, fascia from the flat muscles, or the aponeurosa. I shouldn't say fascia, the aponeurosa of the flat muscles. We'll talk about that, though. Uh, but there's the a cut through it with the fascicle of the rectus abdominis removed. You can see the posterior rectus sheath, anterior rectus sheath, 
inferior epigastric vessels here, which are important landmarkers, we'll see. And remember, the posterior rectus sheath is weird because all of a sudden, about halfway between the belly button and symphysis pubis, it just says, I quit, and it doesn't go anymore. And so that's called the arcuate line where that occurs. There's a special type of hernia that occurs where the arcuate line meets the linea semilunaris, which is semi, linea semilunaris is this tissue right here at the very out lateral most portion of the rectus dominus. There's a weak spot right there. We'll talk about that one. Okay, but here's the flat muscles, external oblique, internal oblique, and the transversus abdominis. Remember, I don't like calling it the transverse abdominis. That's a really old AK, transversus abdominis. And then what's deep to the transversus abdominis? Then you have your fascial layer. So you have your transversalis fascia, and then your extra peritoneal fascia, and then your parietal peritoneum. Okay, everybody good with that? Now let's talk, let's dig a little more. Here's an overhead view. Now let's talk about the leafs a little bit. It's good for your board review coming up too. So uh, here's external oblique, internal oblique, uh, transversus abdominis is the third muscle in. And you can see their aponeurosi are, are continuing to encase the rectus abdominis muscle. And the star of the show here, each one of these, I think I have a, a picture coming up, but each one of these uh, aponeurosis is actually double layered. Uh, there's two uh, lam, uh, lamellae, it's like the lamellae of the annulus fibrosis. There's two lamellae, or some people call them a leaf, at each level. So the external oblique has two lamellae, an anterior and a posterior, we call the anterior posterior leaf. Internal oblique has an anterior and posterior. Transversus abdominis has an anterior and posterior. These are all morphed together. The one that's interesting, great board question, is this internal oblique muscle. Uh, it's lamellae split into an anterior and posterior, but the weird thing is the anterior one goes around the front of the rectus abdominis, the posterior leaf or lamellae or lamella goes around the back side. Um, so that's always interesting. All of the aponeurosi meet in the middle and they overlap, not shown in this picture, and uh, that forms the linea alba. Okay, probably got way ahead of my slides here. Now, remember I said that about between the belly button and the symphysis pubis that the things change and all of a sudden all of the posterior rectus sheath quits. And here's a picture halfway between the belly button and the symphysis pubis and you can see that. There is no, there's no posterior rectus sheath below that arcuate line. And see how all of the aponeurosis of the flat muscles now all go anterior uh, to the aponeurosis. So there's no no encasement back here. Some people believe that that's a weakness, creates a weakness. Okay, probably everything I said already. Aponeurosis from all flat muscles completely encases the majority. The rectus abdominis, uh, this common aponeurosis has two parts. There's an anterior and posterior rectus sheath, which we talked about. Kind of jumped ahead of my slides, didn't I? Each of the flat muscles gives rise to an aponeurosis, which makes the, apone which makes the rectus sheath. Each flat muscle's aponeurosis is double leafed, or you could call it a, lama, a, a, lama, a, a lamina for singular, lamellae for plural. There's the anterior and posterior <clears throat> lamellae. Okay. Uh, interestingly, they're fibers, though. <clears throat> so you're thinking, why in the heck is there two leaves if they just morph together? Just exactly like the lamellae of the annulus fibrosis, they are uh, orthogomic. They are at 90 degrees. The fibers are at 90 degrees to each other. Uh, so as they morph together, it makes a very, very strong aponeurosis. So that's why there's two leaves. Stand ring, by the way, you know that is. That's the big uh, Gray's Anatomy by Susan Standring. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm in my the third edition, I think, of it now since she's taken over. 
just there are a lot of mistakes in that book. I'm really not still not happy. They're cleaning them up, but I was really surprised, especially the captions. You have to when you see figures with captions, somebody different is doing the captions than someone uh, is doing the actual writing of the text, and they need to clean that up. I'm disappointed with that book. Okay, here's everything I was saying. Uh, only this author should have drawn the anterior over here, but they didn't. So the anterior we're looking. This is a uh, it would be A to P view of the rectus sheath. So this is the anterior rectus sheath, posterior rectus sheath. Here's one of the fascicles or one of the rectus abdomini. I guess this would be the left side. And now you can see how these uh, how these leaves work. So the external oblique has a anterior and posterior leaf. Notice how the fibers, the collagen, type 2 collagen, makes these up. Notice how it runs perpendicular to each other. So that makes it really strong. <clears throat> Notice how the internal oblique splits, its anterior leaf goes to the anterior rectus sheath, its posterior leaf goes to the posterior rectus sheath. See how that is? So with that in mind, <clears throat> if I, if for you gross two people who might be watching, if I took, this is these three layers here are the anterior rectus sheath, if I peeled this back and stuck a pin in this this way, that would be the internal or the anterior leaf, or, uh, yeah, that's right, anterior leaf of the internal oblique. <clears throat> if I pulled the rectus abdominis out of the way and stuck a pin just in the posterior rectus sheath, that first layer would be the posterior leaf of the internal oblique. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay, see how that works? All right, I'm not going to dig too much into gross too. Not even sure, probably not even teaching it by the time you're reading this. But anyway, okay, so that's enough of that. I talked about the arcuate line already. That's the end of the posterior rectus sheath. Kind of talked about all this. There's a, just a blow up of that same. This is an A to P view. There's the umbilicus. There's the arcuate line. So this is the so, okay, let me see if you're paying attention. What if I stuck a pin in this? Posterior rectus sheath. Okay, you, I may give you the point, but you won't get the smiley face, right? How do you get the smiley face? Good, that's the posterior leaf of the internal oblique muscle. Okay, that's in for your medical students and everybody. You better know that. You need to know it at that depth. All right. Anterior rectus sheath, we said this already. Posterior rectus sheath, we talked about that. Okay, so another one. And you can see which wasn't included in these other layers. Then the deep fascial layers would be right beneath this. All right, the lines are always uh, important, <clears throat> especially if you're in my gross two class. I like these lines. Uh, linea alba is that line. It's the intertwining of all uh, the front portion. <clears throat> so who would make up the linea alba? That's a great question. Well, it would be both leaves of the external oblique and the anterior leaf of the posterior oblique, the overlapping, or the anterior, or I'm sorry, <clears throat> the anterior leaf of the internal oblique. That's it. There's no linea uh, alba on the back side. Okay, uh, the horizontal running, like the six pack and eight pack, uh, those are called tendinous intersections. Uh, there's typically one at the xiphoid, which you don't see very good. There's one at the umbilicus that creates a six six pack. <clears throat> Some people have an extra one in there, uh, and that gives them an eight pack. Uh, what do they do? They anchor the two fascicles of the rectus abdominis uh, to the linea alba and they anchor it to the anterior rectus sheath. <clears throat> Linea semilunaris, <clears throat> that's just, I showed you that earlier, that's the outer portion of the, the lateral most part of the rectus abdominis and the rectus sheath. Uh, there's a thickening there, and that's the linea semilunaris. Okay, here is a eight pack, right? <clears throat> it's supposed to have one here. At one here, and then he's got an extra one here. So 
one, two, three, four, eight pack. Okay, but you can see these are the tenderness intersections here. Linea semilunaris over here. Linea alba here in the middle. Rectus abdominis, and then these are the flat external oblique. These are the flat muscles over here. Another picture. Mm, nothing more we need to say there. Try not to jump ahead of my slides. In deep fascia we talked about. So after or deep to the posterior rectus sheath, there's three layers of deep fascia we talked about. There's transversalis fascia uh, that gives support to the abdominal mall. Very important. You get a defect here. You can get a hernia. Then the extraperitoneal fascia, <clears throat> all those AKAs, preperitoneal fat, extraperitoneal extra fat. <clears throat> Grace calls it the uh, extraperitoneal fascia. Parietal peritoneum is the deepest layer. We talked about that already. Okay, here is just a num another picture showing you the how the layers. I think we talked about that enough. Uh, you can now see though the well. Here's 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 the layers. So if, what if I threw that on the test, or what if a gross two teacher threw this on the test and said, stick a pin through that? What are the layers? And where are we? Are we above or below the umbilicus? Are we above or below here? Well, look at the transversalis, uh, transversus abdominis. Anterior and posterior leaves are going, creating the posterior rectus sheath, so we've got to be above the arcuate line, so we're above the, the belly button. Specifically, we're, we're above the halfway point between the belly button and the symphys pubis. All right. <clears throat> All right, inguinal region. Wow, this is a tough story. <clears throat> you probably don't know this region very well. It's a board favorite, though. you got to know this stuff. Achilles' heel, right? Achilles got shot with an arrow in his heel. That was his only weakness. This is the weakness of most health, uh, primary health care providers. So, uh, and uh, this is Hope. It's a surgical book. Uh, I got a lot of this from. It's deeper than, than Grey's Anatomy, both Grey's Anatomy books. So you really get the story here. So the anatomy of this inguinal region is very rarely correctly taught or understood. Uh, it's super confusing. I try to do the best I can with it. The authors don't even agree when you start talking about the borders of the inguinal canal. It's a mess. So I try to stay with grays uh, because those are board books for medical and for chiropractic students. Uh, it's bordered by, so where's the inguinal region? It's bordered by the thigh the proximal thigh, uh, medially by the pubic tubercle, and laterally by the anterior superior iliac spine, the ASA, ASIS. And when it comes to weakness, the inguinal canal is the Achilles heel of the groin. So it's a weak area. Not only is weak in your knowledge base, it's just a weak area. So hernias love to happen here. And we'll get the next tape or the next uh, video we'll talk about all these hernias. So inguinal canal, so it's oblique passageway connects the anterior inferior region of the peritoneal cavity uh, to the scrotum in man. <clears throat> Where's it going in women? Where's the inguinal canal? Do they have one? They don't have a scrotum, right? But they do. It actually connects kind of dead ends in the labia majora. So they do have when it's not as well developed. Uh, it's bordered by a pair of openings. You need to know these for boards and what makes them. Uh, the deep inguinal ring, also commonly called the internal inguinal ring. I don't see every now and then posterior inguinal ring, but it's either the deep inguinal ring uh, or the internal inguinal ring. And then on the top side, there's a superficial inguinal ring or the external inguinal ring. Let's take a look at the cartoon. You can see them right here. There's the external inguinal ring, spermatic cord coming out, and the deep one you just have to see kind of back here. Average adult, the canal is about four and a half centimeters long. Borders are important, but their their authors are all over the place on these things. We'll look at them though. Uh, one of the most important structures of this canal is the inguinal ligament also called the uh, 
port art ligament. Uh, the ligament is formed, you should know what the inguinal, lingua, uh, inguinal ligament is formed from. It's external uh, oblique aponeurosa, kind of curls and forms it. Connects between the ASIS and the pubic tubercle. There it is right there from A to P view. We'll look at the posterior side. I bet you don't know much about the back of this ligament because there is a, it's kind of a double ligament. Uh, down here there is a lacunar ligament which kind of connects it uh, to the superior pubic ramus and this ligament of Cooper that kind of extends over the superior pubic ramus as well. Those aren't super important. Uh, there's an obturator canal, right? Here's the obturator foramen. There's obturator membrane. Obturator externus would be on top of this. Internus would be on the back. But there, I've stuck this in gross one. I've stuck a pipe cleaner through this. A lot of people get it wrong, but that's the obturator canal. That's where your obturator nerve and vessels come out of. Here is a A to P overhead view of the inguinal ligament. And here's the the makings of the femoral triangle where you have iliopsoas, uh, pectineus, which would extend underneath this as well. The adductor longus, this would be the medial portion of the triangle. And uh, sartorius would be the lateral border of the femoral triangle. The floor is the iliopsoas, pectineus. What's the medial floor of the femoral triangle? Hmm. It's actually abductor longus. The medial portion of abductor longus uh, is actually the medial floor of the femoral triangle where the medial furthermost portion makes up the medial border of the femoral triangle. Uh, navel, nerve, femoral nerve, artery, femoral, common. Remember we like common femoral artery here and it splits into a deep femoral artery and just the regular femoral artery. We talked about that in the lab. Uh, and then we have the femoral vein and navel, N-A-V, where's L? That's the lymphatics, where, which are over pectineus here. Uh, they're not shown in this picture. We don't see them in the dissections either. Okay, <clears throat> so where's the inguinal canal? Just behind or posterior. Um, oh, we're still talking about structure. So I told you about what's the back side of that, that ligament. The inguinal ligament has another component called the iliopubic tract, also called Thompson's ligament or the deep curl ligament. So a lot of confusion exists about this, but it's an extension of the inferior portion of transversalis fascia. Probably not very high yield board stuff, I don't think, but if you want to know everything, you know how I am. I have to know everything. Uh, although the inguinal canal is more well developed in males, females have it too, it's not very well developed. It contains, we'll go over the contents, which are great board questions, but in males, the spermatic cord, female, the round ligament. Um, but, well, I won't jump ahead of my slides. We'll tell you what's in there in a little while. So here is uh, a, a to P view. It's kind of an oblique view. Anterior would really be up here. Posterior would be kind of coming out of the plane of the page over here. Uh, there, this is a male. There's the spermatic cord. Uh, this is the inguinal, lig uh, inguinal ligament, this whole big piece running back under here. But we haven't looked at the back side of it yet. So that's actually called the iliopubic tract, iliopubic tract or Thompson's ligament that runs back there. Okay, now you can see the deep inguinal ring right here. And you can't see the superficial inguinal ring. And then you can see flat muscles, transversus abdominis, transversalis fascia which is not shown. Spermatic cord, <clears throat> interesting structure. Uh, spermatic cord, these are great board questions. What are the layers of the spermatic cord? There's an external spermatic fascia. The testes descends and it pushes right through the aponeurosa of the flat muscles as we'll see. And it takes with it these layers. For example, the very first layer takes with it is the the external oblique aponeurosa and uh, but it changes names it's called now the external spermatic fascia but it used to be the external oblique aponeurosa 
the middle layer is the cremasteric muscle and fascia uh, so this is kind of a mix between internal oblique uh, muscle and it's got a few fibers from the transversus abdominis muscle within it uh, although we technically for boards and things it's uh, it's an extension of the internal oblique aponeurosa so cremasteric muscle and fascia it's kind of a mix and then the innermost layer is internal spermatic fascia was its extension of transversalis fascia okay strangely enough the transverse abdominis muscle really dead ends although it does kick a few fibers muscle fibers into this but it's strange how it dead ends okay here is the peritoneal cavity right here peritoneal cavity here is the spermatic cord testes would be down out of the view here here's the deep inguinal ring which would be this part right here where the dotted line is there is the are these backwards these are these are backwards right yeah that should be the deep inguinal ring this is this so sorry about that uh, this is the this is the uh, no yeah that's right that's got to be the deep right because we're coming out of the peritoneal cavity so that's the deep this is the superficial inguinal ring I'll have to change this in the next class so superficial inguinal ring deep inguinal ring watch out for that okay uh, the point of the slide is though uh, the testes has went through the deep fascia went through um, all the aponeurosa and even some of the muscles of the, the flat muscles and it's taken all this stuff with it and so for example let's go from the inside out here is the uh, this layer right here is the external oblique aponeurosa and see how that goes down and so that becomes the external oblique aponeurosa that's the outer layer that becomes the external spermatic fascia see how that works here's the internal oblique muscle and it takes that with it. it turns into a fascia not it should really be the drawing should have made it fascia here it takes that with it there's internal oblique so that makes up the cremasteric uh, cremasteric muscle uh, and it it takes maybe it takes I think it does I think I screwed that up too transverse abdominus does nothing it dead ends right here at the deep inguinal ring so the cremasteric fiber or the muscle fiber actually come from the internal oblique uh, muscle itself as it kind of, that's why it's kind of a mix of muscle uh, and that's why the author showed it like this okay so transversus abdominis does nothing uh, transversalis fascia is interesting so notice transversalis fascia uh, that's a member of the deep fascia but now it's not it's it goes down they say when uh, for boards they'll say that the deep inguinal ring is made through a, in a cut through the transversalis fascia well it's kind of true but it's more they should say it's an invagination of transversalis fascia the screen thing right here because uh, that goes down we'll see where that becomes later uh, but the next layer the um, the extra peritoneal fascia layer or preperitoneal fat layer um, that doesn't really go down it maybe goes down a bit but it doesn't completely go down and parietal peritoneum doesn't go at all there's a like an opening in the preperitoneum or uh, parietal peritoneum that it goes through okay okay oh I have it correct here so that's the superficial external ring this is just a picture um, a little bit blown up down when we see what this stuff becomes there's the external spermatic fascia cremasteric muscle fascia uh, and then the internal spermatic fascia layers that cover the testes I'm not going to test you on this but for boards you should know this stuff you stuck a pin through the testes uh, what what do you get so epidermis is the top of the scrotum epidermal tissue we're going right through the scrotum then there's the dermis so that's the skin epidermis and dermis of the skin then we have dartos fascia uh, which is the next layer down that's the the superficial fascia layer then there's external spermatic fascia cremasteric same layers internal spermatic fascia and then here's a new one here's the tunica vaginalis we'll talk about that uh, there's a parietal layer 
which is the outer layer of the testes, uh, and then there's a cavity between them, and the inner layer of the testes is the tunica vaginalis, and then deep to that is a tough white tunica albuginea, and then the tunica vasculosis under that. Okay, there they are. All right. It's just another picture about everything we talked about. Let's see how the cremasteric layer here, it's just kind of a mix. It's got some tissue in there and it's got some muscle fiber as well. All right, deep inguinal ring. Let's see, just a review of this. So uh, it's an, not an imagination, it's an invad. You can see I just, these are brand new slides. First time I've really lectured on them. It is the first time I lectured on them. I just made them yesterday. Uh, it's an invagination of the transversalis fascia. So if you see a board question saying a cut or it's a break in the transverse, that's what they're after. But it's really technically an invagination because it goes all the way down. Larger in males, little rant there about that. Uh, it's the beginning of the inguinal canal. So this is the start going from inside to out. It's located midway between the ASIS and the pubic symphysis. 1.5 centimeters above the inguinal ligament and lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels. So everybody's like falling asleep, but here's the key. This is, you better wake up now. <clears throat> There's something called Hasselbach's triangle or the inguinal triangle. Um, this, you have to know this, the deep inguinal ring is lateral to Hasselbach's triangle. That's very important with regard to internal versus external uh, inguinal hernia. So we better look at it. So here is the left A to P view of the rectus abdominis muscle. Linea semilunaris would be right here, this black structure. I don't think that's labeled. Okay, here's the inguinal ligament, ASIS over here, pubic tubercles here. And here's our favorite vessels, the inferior epigastric artery and vein. We've seen those, you get tested on those in the lab. So the space in between here, um, this, is Hasselbeck's triangle. This is Hasselbeck's triangle. Uh, so the deep inguinal ring is outside, lateral to Hasselbeck's triangle. Remember, or this is not an A to P view. This is a P to A view. We're inside the belly looking out. Belly button's blocked and covered, right? So this is an inside to out view. So there's the deep inguinal ring. Superficial inguinal ring would be located right about here. Everybody good? And what else I want to say about that? I think that's all I want to say about that. Superficial inguinal ring, more superficially, showed you where it was located. Uh, kind of somewhat triangular shaped in females. Uh, it's a invagination is an invagination of the external oblique aponeurosis. On my rant again about they'll probably say a cut in the external oblique, but that's not quite right. Uh, it's squeezed down to the inferior tip of Hasselbach's triangle, as I just saw you, uh, between the inguinal ligament and linea semilunaris. Lateral portion is fortified by some of the inguinal ligament. Here's another view, better view um, of it. We've already seen it, though. Now I just have it drawn in. See how it's kind of squished? There's a rectus abdominis. It's squished right down at this point. So here's the borders of the inguinal canal. By Drake, I have a little bit of hope uh, put in here as well. So this is a pretty good story here. This should be good for board. So the roof is formed by the arching fibers of the transverse, transversus abdominis muscle, makes up the roof, uh, and the internal oblique muscle. The floor or the inferior wall, so the roof would be the superior wall. Uh, the floor, of course, would be the inferior wall. Uh, that's formed by the medial one half of the inguinal ligament. How about the back side? That's an important one. That's formed by transversus abdominis, aponeurosa. And the anterior border is, of course, the uh, external oblique aponeurosa, uh, as well as the internal oblique muscle. Okay, there's just a little picture of it. I need to talk about that. There's another picture to help you figure things out. 
Okay, contents. This, now this is a good, easy, great board questions. What's the for males? What's inside the inguinal canal? Spermatic cord. Great. What's inside the spermatic cord? Ductus deferens, aka vas deferens, right where the sperm goes. Uh, there's three arteries: a testicular artery, differential artery, and a cremasteric artery. There's a venous plexus. There's not just a vein to match. There's a whole nest of uh, of venous blood vessels. It's called the panpiniform plexus, very easily seen in the cadavers. There's three nerves as well. I like this one. Genital branch of the genital femoral nerve, uh, the inguinal, ilioinguinal nerve, and sympathetic fibers from the hypogastric plexus. What about in females? That's the round ligament of the uterus, sometimes called ligamentum teres. That's why Mark gave points off for you guys. The liver, remember? There's a ligamentum teres. So that's why you have to say of the liver. There, because here's another ligamentum teres. But we call it the round ligament. So what's the nerves? Gentle branch of genital femoral nerve. The ilioinguinal nerve, again. <clears throat> and cremasteric vessels. And it's made from the same fascial covenants that we already described for males. Uh, only they're not as well developed. All right, here's an important one for hernias. So if I'm going to test you, I even got a star in there for you. First described by a guy named Hasselbeck way back in the 1800s. Uh, classic space, uh, also called, I should put it AKA, it's the inguinal triangle as well. And you know the borders already, the medial a border is the lateral portion of rectus abdominis. More specifically, it's the semilunar uh, line, aka linea semilunaris, aka uh, Spigelian's line. That's where Spigelian hernia uh, occurs. I talked about that already. Inferior border is the inguinal ligament. Superior lateral border is the inferior epigastric artery and vein. Uh, the weakness inside this region is responsible for what's called a direct inguinal hernia. A direct, if you're throwing darts and you stick a dart inside the inguinal triangle or Hasselbeck's triangle, it's a direct hit. So it's a direct hernia goes directly inside Hasselbeck's triangle, right? If it goes through the deep, it cheats, it goes down the deep inguinal ring the hernia goes down there. It's called an indirect inguinal hernia. Okay, super high yield board stuff right there. High yield for my test, so make sure you know that. So throwing darts, if we hit the Hasselbeck's triangle or inguinal triangle, here's another P to A view from the inside out. If we get a hit anywhere, you have yourself a direct inguinal hernia. If the hernia comes, I guess it could come through the transversalis fascia here. Uh, but it's probably not. It's going to go through this hole in the transverse fascia, or this invagination of it. So that's called, it's not a direct hit. That's an indirect inguinal hernia. Got it? Don't mess that up. Okay, oh, this is dreaded embryology, but in order to understand an indirect inguinal hernia, you need to understand what the process vagin uh, vaginalis is. And I'm sure you remember from your embryology who covered this. I'm sure they covered this in depth because it's such a high yield board topic. But let's talk about it. Uh, let's see. Very difficult story. Embryology is always talk about Achilles heel. That's everybody's Achilles heel. Uh, so we're not going to go too crazy in it. But uh, it's a herniation of peritoneal tissue uh, which occurs. So it's not a separate structure. It's considered a herniation uh, of parietal peritoneum uh, that goes down through the inguinal canal during embryogenesis. So in, our, in order to understand the story, there's another player. There's also somebody called the gubernaculum. And this is where the story starts. This is a band of tissue and it connects the testes, which are now in the abdomen. The testes haven't descended yet. Uh, and it's a, it stretches all the way down to the scrotum. So it's going to help reel in the testes from the abdomen through the inguinal canal and into the testes. It's a little more complicated, but that's for our purposes. That's good enough. Uh, it's a mesenchymal tissue. It's uh, 
then starts to form around this band, this gluinaculum, uh, and that band of mesenchymal tissue morphs into the inguinal canal itself. So how so we how does it widen? Uh, in order to widen up that inguinal canal, because when it when it goes around the gubernaculum, it's just a skinny little tube. Nothing can go through it, so it needs to widen. So uh, a downward herniation uh, of peritoneum begins to push itself down, and we're in embryological days. The baby's not born yet, so it starts pushing down and down and down. Uh, and that herniation again is the prost. Uh, Process, processes vaginalis. So as the gubernaculum starts to retract and uh, starts to suck in, it pulls those abdominal testes down and starts forcing that inguinal bigger and bigger. It also takes it takes with it all those uh, layers of uh, aponeurosis from the flap muscles as it goes down. That's why they get covered like that. So process vaginalis continues to grow down toward the, the scrotum and some people believe so remember we're, we're, we got the testes the process vaginalis is reeling those testes into the scrotum but the glubernaculum is also getting deeper and deeper and follows the testes as they move down some researchers believe that it actually helps pull the testes down as well so after the testes finally get all the way down into the scrotum here's the key point so this process vaginalis, which has perhaps helped push the testes into the uh, scrotum, the process vaginalis now is supposed to, I can't see me, but I have my little quote fingers going, it's supposed to disintegrate into nothing. Uh, and great if it does, but not so great if it doesn't, as we'll see when we talk about hernias. So the very distal portion of it actually morphs into something you're familiar with. That's the tunica vaginalis. So tunica vaginalis uh, came from the processus vaginalis. Okay, everybody got that? Now, my little quotes, supposed to disintegrate. Sometimes it doesn't disintegrate. And some people, a lot of people, about 25% according to standring, the proximal uh, processus vaginalis doesn't disintegrate. In fact, it stays open, and now we have a direct opening from the peritoneal cavity in to the inguinal canal and even into the testes. It's a direct shot. Normally, it's sealed. You can't you can't get in to the deep inguinal ring because remember the parietal peritoneum and the preperitoneal fat or extraperitoneal fascia. They don't play the game. They don't open. They're not part of that inguinal canal. They protect the abdominal cavity from herniating down that tube. But uh, but remember the process vaginalis, that was a that was a herniation, that was an invagination going all the way down. If that thing is still open, now we have a direct route uh, and then it greatly increases the chances for developing an indirect why is it indirect inguinal hernia? Go back to the dartboard. We're throwing darts. Deep inguinal ring is outside the Hasselbach's triangle so you miss the target it's an indirect it's a miss it's not a direct hit let's look at a picture all right so here's the testes in a, a two-month-old fetus they're up inside the abdomen okay number one here's the gluinaculum which is a this weird band of tissue that it's going to be down here it's anchored to where the scrotum will be it's like I like to think of this as a fishing pole and this is the line and it's caught a fish now it's got to reel it in and at, with the passage of time it starts contracting and shriveling up and shrinking as it does it reels in the fish uh, the fish is pulled through the this would be the inguinal canal uh, and everything is great but to help reeling in the fish we have this weird thing it's going to form right here in the peritoneum there's going to be a a weirdness that happens here and all of a sudden the peritoneum is going to start growing down and down and down and this this ingrowth or bulging inward of the pro is called the processus vaginalis it's really nothing more than a herniation of parietal peritoneum 
parotoperitoneum. I don't think I'll ever be able to say that word right. It's too burned into my brain. Um, but yeah, so that's the process vaginalis. And it follows the testes. So some people believe there's like some connection here and it helps pull it down here. Okay, and then here's the set by the seventh month. You'll see how, look how far the process vaginalis goes. Uh, it's following the testes. And here's right at birth. Testes are now down in the little scrotum. And look at how shrunken down the uh, the, glub the glubernaculum is. See, it's just a little stub. So the fish has been reeled in, but the process vaginalis has followed it all the way down. Uh, now, I don't have this shown, but now this next step would be after birth, this disintegrates into nothing except for this remnant, and that becomes the tunica vaginalis. Tunica vaginalis. Okay, everybody understand that? All right. Switch gears. Femoral sheath. So, femoral sheath, new piece of anatomy now talking the inguinal the femoral triangle right at the inguinal canal femoral sheath it's a funnel a downward protrusion of transversalis fascia anteriorly and posteriorly iliac fascia so both of these are going to poke down just like this just like the process vaginalis came down same thing's going to happen with uh, this tissue of that creates the femoral sheath. It's going to invaginate and herdiate uh, downward, and it forms this little triangular-like tunnel. Uh, the beginning of the femoral sheath would be the inguinal ligament, and it's going to extend all the way into the inguinal triangle, sometimes all the way to the end. But usually, it goes about... Uh, three or four centimeters in length and then it kind of morphs in uh, to the adventitia around the adventitia layer of the blood vessels. Okay at the beginning there's a ring-like structure so we said this uh, it's at the inguinal uh, ligament and this ring-like structure the starting of the femoral sheath is called the femoral ring so that's important to know. Uh, at its most inferior point, it blends in with the adventitia of the femoral vessels, as we just said. It's filled with this little grainy connective tissue, the soft, almost a fat-like connective tissue. The femoral sheath has three separate compartments. Now we're getting important because we're going to we have a femoral hernia, of course, we need to talk about. There's a lateral compartment uh, which contains the femoral artery. There's an intermediate compartment or middle compartment that contains the femoral vein and a medial compartment, this is the key here, contains the lymph vessels. Right? The board question, is the femoral nerve part of the femoral canal, femoral sheath? No. It's outside or it's outside of that. Okay. So artery, vein, uh, but no nerve just the lymphatic vessels. So this one has a special, this this innermost canal is called the femoral canal. It's got a special name because that's where hernias can occur. Here's a beautiful, uh, beautiful picture of the femoral triangle would be here. So here's sartorius, inguinal ligament, ductor longus, be right here. Here's the nerve that's not inside the femoral sheath, mind you, right? Nerve is not inside the femoral sheath. Here's the femoral sheath right here, okay? Nerve, artery, vein, and there's the lymph system right there. Femoral canal is just this compartment. Let's blow it up so you can see these see the subcompartments within the femoral sheath. Lateral, middle for the vein, medial, and that medial is the femoral canal super important? Everybody got that? What's in the medial? Uh, what's in the femoral canal? It's the lymph. It's the lymph vessels, the lymph nodes, and lymph vessels. And that's where the hernia goes. Uh, let's see. You might wonder why we need a special compartment for the squishy lymph vessels. Well, it's thought that uh, these are squishy. This thing can get really big, right? This is stretchable especially if you've been on your feet all day, this will start to grow. And there's plenty of wiggle room in here. It's a squishy structure. It can be pushed way over. So it's thought to 
it's thought it can give it some extra room. Okay, let's see. Board is the femoral canal. Uh, anterior would be the inguinal ligament. Posterior border would be the pectineus muscle. Medial border would be the lateral edge of the lacunar ligament. Lateral border would be the femoral vein in its its intermediate compartment. This should be superior border. Let me make a note of that as well. Right? That should the anterior border be fascia lata. So that's superior. We are on slide 59. I need to fix too. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, now we're almost there. <clears throat> the dreaded and feared belly button. Seems like a simple structure. It's an anatomical nightmare. Again, authors are all over the place. I had to go to the really expensive surgical anatomy books to get the story. Standring does not, she does okay on this, but Drake's not even, the, forget that one. But if you want to know the anatomy of the umbilicus, you have to go. Or you can just read here. I've done all the work for you. Um, AKA for the umbilicus, there it is. Uh, it's a navel. Uh, very complex region. All authors are all over the place. Uh, it's described as a puckered scar or a fibrocicatrix. Uh, and it is, what is it? It's the old attachment site for the umbilical cord. Right? Remember the umbilical cord here? Uh, there's a, from the inside of this uh, newborn, uh, you can see the umbilical cord. And these pipes are important, right? We studied all these in gross too. See, all this stuff is important. So you get a good understanding, but it, it does come back. Uh, there's the umbilical vein, uh, which there's the fal uh, falsi falsiform ligament. In the bottom of the falsiform ligament lives the uh, umbilical vein in the newborn. But after they're born, this dries up. And this vein, is that important? That's where all the arterial blood comes from mom. It's super important. That's the round ligament of the liver, or ligamentum teres of the liver. It's got some weird Latin name we'll look at here in a minute. Notice there's only one structure coming into the, the abdominal wall here. On the bottom, we have three structures. So we have the urachus coming in, which is like a, a fetal uh, urethra, drains the bladder of waste products into the, uh, into the mom. And uh, that would become the median umbilical ligament. And then we have a right and left umbilical artery, which will become the median umbilical ligaments. So notice there's three structures. Guess what? When all this stuff dries and crusts up, uh, the inferior portion of the floor of the belly button is much stronger uh, than the superior portion. So a lot of times uh, herniations can occur up in the superior region. Okay, here's another PDA view of the same thing. Umbilicus, all those structures I just talked about. You guys should make sure you know these. It's a gross two review. I, if I threw a question, I wouldn't. I could definitely throw a question on that. All right, how does this darn thing form? So normally, uh, the embryological structure structures will atrophy after birth. So those ducts and the rakets and all that stuff, it starts drying up. So uh, there's also an umbilical ring, uh, which the, I don't think anybody really labeled the umbilical ring. Uh, so the umbilical ring would be right in this whole structure right here. This would be the area of the umbilical ring. So obviously the umbilical ring has to atrophy and shrink down to nothing. And as it shrinks, it gets hard and thick, forms a plate, and that's called the umbilical plate. Standring calls it the fibrous layer of the umbilical floor. So authors are all over the place. Sometimes they'll call it the umbilical floor. Sometimes the umbilical plate. I like umbilical plate. Uh, you can you can Google that one and research and pull stuff up up about it. So, but these are AKA's boards may say the fibrous layer, but all of all it is is the a mixture of the umbilical ring uh, and all of these all of these pipes coming in here see all these guys this all scars up and that forms the floor of the umbilicus the lower portion of the plate is stronger 
because of all we said that already. The upper portion is weaker because it only has that round ligament of the liver uh, to fortify it, to make it strong. Okay, so what's underneath the umbilical plate? Transversalis fascia. <clears throat> so now we're into the deep fascia layers. But in not most, but not all people, transversalis fascia thickens get in this region underneath the umbilicus. It gets really, really thick to add more strength to it. And if it thickens, it gets a new name, and it's called the umbilical fascia. Umbilical fascia. Okay, uh, one weird thing about it, uh, this region, you know, there's subcutaneous tissue everywhere over your belly. There's double layer of it below your belly button, <coughs> campus and scarpus. But the, um, the whole area around the umbilicus has no subcutaneous layer. Uh, it's a, there's a hole in it. So that's a weakness right there. It's missing one layer that the entire abdominal wall has and it doesn't have so it's missing the subcutaneous layer okay <clears throat> therefore the dermis layer uh, is adhered directly to the um, uh, umbilical fascia or umbilical fascia or the transversalis fascia if it doesn't thicken up into the umbilical fascia okay so that's a little strange but so that's a, that's a weakness to it uh, okay so when all this stuff scars up, the umbilical cord falls off, all this stuff is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. It starts to pucker a little bit, uh, and that's, it looks like a puckered scar, and that is the umbilicus, right? The depression, you know, you can stick your finger, most of us can stick your finger in your belly button. It goes down like about the, the distal phalanx worth. Um, that's called the umbilical canal. So that's the little depression left behind in us uh, grown-up people uh, let's see so some key some more embryology and everybody's going oh no not the dreaded but we need to know this because there's a Michael's diverticulum super common high yield board stuff so hang in there we're almost done um, so there's this uh, vitiline I learned it as vitiline but it's often pronounced uh, vitilin like Ritalin vitilin duct or vitiline duct there's a ton of ways to pronounce it Vit, I learned it as vitiline duct or uh, vitilo intestinal duct it's a, it's a nice one because it tells you where it runs from but most of the time it's vitilin duct uh, so once it connect uh, once upon a time I'm not going to get crazy into embryology but remember there's a yolk sac so it connects the yolk sac to the terminal portion of the ilium and if this doesn't dry up, if this vitiline duct doesn't dry up, then you have a tube there and you can have different, maybe half dries up, maybe it all dries up, maybe none of it dries up. So you can have different presentations, but any of those, it's called a Michael's diverticulum or Meckel's diverticulum, which we'll look at in the next. I don't know, this is getting pretty long. I might just, I probably should do one more because we're so far behind in this class. Then there's the median umbilical ligament. We talked about that. Um, that once upon a time was the like a urethra. It drained the bladder into the umbilical cord. Uh, even before that, it started out as tissue called the atlantos. And then the atlantos morphed into uh, the urachus. The urachus was the tube, the kind of the fake, the fake urethra. And then the urachus dries up when you're born to become the median umbilical ligament which is that remember that picture right in the middle you can go back and look at that uh, the medial umbilical ligaments those used to be obliterated umbilical arteries we talked about those uh, ligamentum teres of the liver or I'm sorry the round ligament of the liver we talked about that that is the main pipe connecting uh, that's the umbilical vein, the main pipe bringing oxygenated blood from the mom. We've seen that in gross two a million times. Uh, it's also called ligamentum teres hepatis or ligamentum teres of the liver is fine with me. And some texts call it the left umbilical vein. Some just call it the umbilical vein. There is a right one, but it gets obliterated. We won't get into all that. Remember, it's wrapped in the falciform ligament. All right. 
There's a picture of these structures. There's we can see the umbilical ring. It's not like a giant ring. It's got all these. They just call it. It's the tissue that allows this, uh, the, these pipes to go through. All right. Are we done? Are we almost done? I'm getting there. We're getting there. Oh, this is just some pictures and some. Uh, again, umbilical vein is up here. This is just how the. Uh, how the umbilical cord is formed. There's that allantose. It's down there. It's going to form the urachus, which will become the will become the like makeshift urethra. Oh, some fun facts. Here's Sing. The guy Sing is really cheap. I think it's like an eight dollar anatomy book. He's a from India, I believe. He's a really good at describing stuff, but he does make a few mistakes, and the drawings aren't the greatest. But you can always glean some interesting stuff that he seems to bring out, no one else does. Uh, but anyway, so fun facts: it's positioned in a defect within the linea alba, so there is also a disruption of the linea alba. Uh, uh, specifically, it's about it according to Stannering. It's in its mid, the midpoint of the linea alba is disrupted. And the position is, can be inconsistent. Some people's belly buttons are off center, and some are off center so bad they have to surgically fix them. Uh, where's the linea alba run? All the way down from the xiphoid, all the way down the pubic symphysis, except at the umbilicus, it gets disrupted. The belly button is typically loaded, located at the level of L4, according to Standring. Neurologically, dermatone, the T10 dermatone, wraps around it. And that's why visceral pain from the appendix is classically referred here. Uh, when you stand up, normally it drops down a little bit lower. If you're a child, it might be lower than the halfway point. If you're obese or if you have a pendulous abdomen, it's going to be below the halfway point. Now, remember I said there's no, it has no subcutaneous tissue, right? But the subcutaneous tissue all kind of encircles it and it bunches up and fat extra fat likes to accumulate there so it also often gives you uh, a little lip uh, which kind of pooks up the the ridges of the belly button okay and we said that already all layers of the abdominal wall will fuse to the umbilicus after the cord falls off that's from standring standring's not correct because well, I guess it'll fuse to the umbilical ring, but remember it's missing the subcutaneous layer. Come on, stand ring. Now, the adult has five layers of uh, tissue. We've already talked about those, right? So here's the layers again. So it has skin. If you go right through the middle of the belly button, you'll run into the skin, which is skin is epidermis. Dermis. Uh, there's no subcutaneous layer. Then you'll hit the uh, fibrous layer, according to Standring. Other surgical authors call it the umbilical plate, which is made from the fusion of all that stuff. The, the umbilical ring, round ligament of the liver, median umbilical ligament, medial umbilical arteries, vitellin intestinal duct. I think we said round ligament already. Okay. Underneath... So underneath the umbilical plate, then we have the umbilical fascia. That's where transversal fascia thickens uh, to form this. A bunch of AKAs, uh, Rochette's fascia, umbilical vesicular fascia, umbilical vesicle fascia. Okay, and then finally we hit the deep fascia. The, so we have the extra peritoneal fascia um, and the parietal peritoneum. So extra peritoneal fascia, parietal peritoneum. I can see a question. Which one of these is not a layer of the umbilicus? Can't you see a question coming like that on your final? Considered a watershed with regard to lymph flow uh, because tissue above the umbilicus tends to drain upward. Tissue Below the halfway point of the umbilicus tend to drain down, like you go into the uh, into the lymph nodes and the groin. 
the like infections above will go into the lymph nodes of the axilla. Hey, we're done. Okay. So look for part two. Uh, I'm not sure. I might do this on Tuesday in class. We'll see. This got went longer, over an hour. I probably will get energy. Maybe I'll do it Saturday. I still have to write a test for you guys. Oh, my. Okay. See you later.